Today I'm going to talk about the uh, Dakota Big Drum, um, where that kind of came from and how it kind of spread amongst the uh, tribes here in Minnesota and then uh, further out into the plains and the woodlands. Uh, and it takes place back in the like, late 1800s. And it's about a woman who's named Osinte Wiakawi, which is a uh, tail feather woman. And uh, she was Dakota woman whose uh, village came under attack by uh, Union soldiers, uh, blue coats or long knives as they say. And she uh, escaped out of the uh, village and she fled to a nearby lake. And uh, how she t escaped from capture is that she submerged herself into the lake and she used a reed, uh, she broke it off so she could stay under for a long time and breathe while the soldiers are around looking for her. And over a matter of days of her hiding, she, uh, a vision came to her. She had a vision of this big drum. And what happened was uh, as she was submerged, she saw this drum kind of coming together with buffalo hide and a uh, hollowed out tree trunk. And as this drum was coming together, she could hear this beat. And as she heard this beat, she can hear these words in Dakota that spoke to her and, and taught her about what her next thing in life was going to be. And they kind of guide her uh, in the next journey. And as she submerged herself there, she had this vision. And then as she came out, she had this renewed purpose that she had to find her family again and share this with other people. And, uh, and she went through the village, and there's a couple of versions, but they say that she went into the village where the soldiers are still uh, stationed. And she was able to evade capture through them by just walking straight through the village, gathering food and then leaving and without being detected. And she made a journey across into Minnesota uh, for a few days before she finally met up with the rest of her family uh, that also fled. And she relayed this vision that she had to them. And she relayed this vision to them saying that if we build this drum and we sing these songs that came to me, then you're going to create peace and unity uh, amongst other people. So Lolakota and Owajila, which is to be at peace and to have unity. And so for the rest of her life, she taught this amongst the Ojibwe people, the Anishinaabeg, the original people of northern Minnesota and Canada. And uh, so as a Dakota, they speak different languages, uh, Ojibwe and Dakota. And, uh, but she was able to relay this to them and teach them the songs that are still taught today in the big drum ceremony. And again, the story is still shared amongst people about this drum that brings about peace and unity amongst all people that understand it and, and learn about it. Water may be the most powerful force that we know on this earth. The Marshallese word for island is ailang. And that kind of sounds like they don't know how to pronounce the English word island. But ailang is not an English word. And it has nothing to do with island. It just happens to sound like island. Ailang means I and lang, I, currents, from the ocean floor to the stars movement, right? Lang means sky. So from the ocean floor, currents, movements, including waves and swells, to wind, to the movement of stars in the lang, the sky. That's an island. Line 3 just proposed to create a new route for their pipeline to abandon the current one, which is going through many rivers and many lands, um, indigenous lands specifically. And um, they think it's okay to just abandon that pipeline and create a whole new one when there are going to be no hopes to clean up the current spills that have happened, to clean up that pipeline, the metal that now is within the land, and then just create a brand new pipeline. The oil spills, the oil spills going on in our lakes and our rivers with our wild rice beds are um, unfathomable, really. I don't know how anyone could possibly think that it's okay to dump oil into water.
question about accessibility and water is actually really, really quite profound. I'll give you two examples uh, here in Dakota country, Dakota waters, right? Where the Minnesota and the Mississippi converge, the confluence, the Bedote, is a sacred site of Genesis. It's where they began. Their origin stories, their sacred stories, point to, among other places, that as the portal. But historically, marking the beginnings of America in this place, the Bedote is also what they call the site of their genocide. And so that which was the, the site of their coming into being is also transformed into the site of their extermination and their demise. Right? What better example can you have of a transformation of something that's powerful and life-giving turned into the conditions and the site for violence and destruction? That's one. That's just one example. Another example from Micronesia is the fact that the Rematao, the very people who are, who never lost that sense of sacred relationship with the water, to the point that they call themselves the people of the sea. They're the ones who are the experts in sailing their, the ocean, in articulating their sacred relationship. That powerful relationship with the sea is being supplanted now by rising sea levels caused by global warming and industrialization and all of the kind of unsustainable crap that we're living. Water will spell their doom. I think one of the biggest sins of colonialism was to um, transform how we understood ourselves uh, in ways that actually delimited and belittled uh, and restricted um, the worlds we actually knew. I think that a lot of our young children uh, today are learning about standing up for their rights and standing up for uh, defending themselves and what they know is correct. And so when we have songs like this, we sing them to encourage them to keep doing this and keep spreading that, that vision that that woman had and to make sure that we all live in a world that can be peaceful that we can all share together.